When you receive Christ as your Savior, Christ comes, the Holy Spirit comes, God comes to live in you. The, body, the Bible says that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And throughout these sessions, I want to just keep saying that God lives in you. You don't have to go try to find God. He's in you. You don't have to always feel like you're trying to get to God. He's in you. And as I said last night, God is like a magnetic force on the inside of us. And He's constantly drawing us into Him. Well, we have a soul, and our soul gives us a lot of problems. There's not a thing wrong with your spirit right now if you're born again. Do you know that? Your spirit has been perfected. It's been cleaned up and made holy because God cannot dwell anywhere that is not holy. So when the Holy Spirit comes to live in you, you're made holy, you're filled with righteousness, you have new desires that come in you. That's why the Bible says that he that knew no sin became sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. You've been made right with God through Christ. Now, God wants us to learn how to act right. He gives us a seed of everything that he wants us to do. God is never going to require you to do something and not give you an ability to be able to do it. That's why I, I've been saying a lot for the last couple of years. Anything that God asks you to do or tells you to do, you can do it. He's not going to tell us to do something that we cannot do. So the, the most foolish thing for us to say is, God, that's too hard. I can't. Because if you really believe that God told you to do it, then you can do it. We find it so hard to forgive people who hurt us. And that's our excuse for staying in bitterness. Well, it's just so hard. It's just so hard. But you know what? If we couldn't do it, God wouldn't have filled the Bible with instructions to do it. And, and everything that God tells us to do is for our benefit. Everything that God asked you to do or not to do is for your benefit. So with our body, we contact the world. With our spirit, we contact God. But with the center part of us, with our soul, we contact ourselves. Your soul is your personality. It's, it's you. In your soul, you have desires. You want, you think, you feel. I want, I think, I feel. We all have things that we want, but then God's got some things that He wants. And if His wants don't agree with our wants, then guess whose wants have to go? Have you figured that out yet? Has anybody figured out that God's going to win in the end? Or if he never gets around to winning in your life, then you will be miserable. It's just that simple. You're not going to be happy and out of sorts with God. It's not going to work. It's amazing what a clean conscience does for you. It's wonderful to be at peace. We think, and I talked about that last night, not as much as I would have liked to, but we think, we think, we think, we think, we think, we think. And we get ourselves in so much trouble by thinking. Sometimes we just think a thing to death. It's like God will speak something to us, just like a desire comes in our heart. We know we're supposed to do something. And then all of a sudden our mind kicks in and we start thinking of all the reasons why we shouldn't do it and why it won't work and probably why it's not a good idea and what it's going to cost and how hard it's going to be. And then all of a sudden we're in disobedience again. And we would have been better off if we just wouldn't have thought about it too much. Too much. I've actually found out that I can overstudy. I've learned how to be led by the Spirit in my study. I study until I feel like I'm full. And then I go and I trust God to bring out what He's helped me put in there. But if I, if, if I get it in my mind too much, then I would just get up here and make a mess. The Bible says, lean not to your own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and mind. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. And He will direct your path. Well, we've all got ways. I have ways that I want to do things. You have ways that you want to do things. But God's got to get His way or things are not going to work in our life. Conversion, receiving Christ, marks the initial return of the soul to God. 
And what God is after is what the Bible calls union, which really means oneness. We call, you, you may hear marriage referred to sometimes as the marriage union. Where the man leaves his father and mother and the two become one. One. God wants to be one with us. He wants us to be one with him. That means that we think alike. We want the same things. Jesus said, I only say what I hear my father say. I only do what I see my father do. If you've seen me, you've seen the father. Everything that's his is mine. Everything that's mine is his. Oneness, unity, that gives you power. The moment that we receive Christ as our savior, we step out on a journey, a lifetime journey. And you'll be at this journey your whole entire life. It's not so important that you arrive at the place of perfection before Christ calls you home as it is that you keep moving. That you keep going in God's direction and to the best of your ability, each and everything that you believe that God is asking you to do or not to do, that you do that. God's not going to ask you to do something and not give you the power to do it. God is not going to ask you to do something and not give you the power to do it. If you begin to feel that God is telling you that you need to separate from some certain friends that you have because they're poisoning your soul and they're just not good for you and they're always dragging you down and they're not living the kind of life that you're trying to live and they're always tempting you to go to the wrong places and get involved in the wrong things. Come on, am I talking to anybody? And you know that God is dealing with you but then you think, well, I'm going to be lonely. Well, I'm not going to have any friends. And then you think, well, I don't want to hurt their feelings. And so for all this nonsense, we keep obeying God when really, yeah, you might be lonely for a little while. But you know what? That's not all that bad. When you don't have anybody else, you get to know God really well. And then at the right time. If you sacrifice, now listen, if you sacrifice the thing you're holding on to that's actually making you sick. There's going to be a little pain, a little discomfort in your soul. But then there's a resurrection. After there's a death, there's a resurrection. Some of you care way too much what people think of you. My gosh, I went through that for years. Reputation, reputation, reputation. What are people going to think? And you know what? You just have to die to your reputation and get to the point where you don't care what they think. Well, you may go through for a period of time where that's going to really be painful. But then after a while, you, I mean, there's no freedom like not needing to impress anybody. Oh my gosh, that is so wonderful to just be able to be who you are and not be overly concerned about what people think, not need to impress them or to keep up with them or to compete with them or to compare with them. But well, I'd like to tell you that I was saved on Monday and by Tuesday I had all that, but that's not the truth. <laughs> it's been a journey and a long journey. And I think sometimes my, maybe the initial part of our journey is the hardest for a couple of reasons. One, we're not, we're not accustomed to not doing what we want to do. And so you have to kind of get used to that. Secondly, we don't know very much. We need to be educated. And so... Even me just sharing this with you hopefully will help you because we can't cooperate with what God's trying to do in our life if we totally just don't even understand what he's trying to do. And so I think the initial part is maybe the hardest. That's why sometimes we really need people to help mentor us and we need people that will pray for us and, and we need good Christian friends that will encourage us in our initial walk with God because I think we all know that a lot of people start out right but it's not very long and they backslide because they just don't understand and it all seems so hard and they thought when they received Christ all their problems were over and now we know that's not true right but you know what your worst day with God the worst day you could ever have with God by your side is still better than your best day ever was without it. So we, we step out on this journey, but there are obstacles in our way. Now the soul is an interesting thing because God wants to use our soul, but Satan also wants to use our soul. God wants to speak through your mouth, but the devil wants to speak through your mouth. God wants to think through your mind, but the devil wants to think through your mind. 
God wants to act through your will. He wants your decisions to be in line with him. But the devil wants your decisions to be in line with him. So there's this war that we find ourselves in. It's like we feel sometimes like we're always being pulled in two different directions. I will tell you that it gets easier. Every time you make a decision for God, the next time you make a decision for God, it's a teeny tiny bit easier than it was the last time. And every decision you make for God, it kind of like multiplies the effect of how it's going to affect you the next time because you see the benefits. And now after 32, 33 years of being a serious student of the word and a teacher of the word of God, and really God being the center of my life, it's not all that hard for me now to obey God even in difficult things. But it used to be a nightmare. I mean, you hear me tell my little stories like about putting my grocery cart back. It took me two years, two years to get to the point where I would be obedient to God every time. And when I would go to the grocery store, I mean, this is back when I started. I had a home Bible study. I had my kids, you know, I'm not liking nothing about Dave. I'm wanting him to change. I'm not, I don't like anybody. I don't like myself. You know, all my kids are driving me crazy. And you know, I'm going to the grocery store. I don't have any money. It's just, you know, everything's got to be added up on the calculator. You got to clip the coupons. I mean, the whole thing was a nightmare. And then, so, but I'm already teaching a home Bible study. I've been born again, spirit filled. I got a call in my life. I'm loving God. And God begins to deal with me about putting your grocery cart back where you got it. Why should I do that? Nobody else does. Two years. Two years of God hammering me with that before I would put it back if it was raining, put it back if it was snowing, put it back if I was in a hurry. I mean, put it back right where it needed to be. And if the place where it needed to be was full and my cart wasn't going to fit in there, then I would march it back up to the store and take it in the store and put it where it belonged. Two years. Now, the other day I'm getting my nails done and I go to the restroom and I use the last of the toilet paper on the toilet paper roll. And so, I mean, I know right away Get a new one, figure out where it's at in the room, see if there's any anywhere, get a new one, replace it. Well, you know, my flesh was a little bit like, mm -hmm. I don't know where it's at. Well, look for it. <laughs> well, yeah. But you know, that whole thing took maybe, I don't know, less than a minute. And I did what God told me to do. And you think toilet paper and grocery carts, lady, I came out to hear the word of God. <laughs> Can I tell you something though? If we're not going to obey God in little things like that, then you might as well forget obeying God in other stuff. And you don't all need to go to Bible college to learn how to obey God. You can go to the school of the Holy Ghost and He will teach you wherever you're at. I didn't get to go to Bible college and now look, and I'm telling you the truth. I tell you these stories because that's where God began my training. I spent a lot of time in the grocery store and that's where we started. He was teaching me integrity. He was teaching me to be a woman of godly character, to be a woman of excellence and not to do something the sloppiest, simplest, easiest way that I could get by with, but to do it right, especially when nobody was looking. Nobody was in that bathroom with me. Nobody was going to know if I replaced the toilet paper or if I left it for the next person to do. You don't like it when you go to the bathroom and there's no toilet paper? Well, do unto others. As you would have them do unto you. I don't know what this message will sound like by the time it's translated into Chinese and Indian dialects and, you know. But I'll tell you one thing, we've all got the same problems no matter what language we speak. And God wants us to be people of excellence. God doesn't care what you think, what you want, and how you feel. He wants you to obey Him. I want to think I feel. I want to think I feel. I want you. Well, I don't think I should have to do that. Nobody else does that. <laughs> Two years to put a grocery cart back. Obstacles in our way. Things like a, an unteachable attitude. Being self-centered. It took me years to figure out why I wasn't happy. 
I went to all the seminars, did spiritual warfare, went to intercessory prayer camps, learned how to bind and loose everything that was moving, <laughs> cast out devils, agree, rant and rave, carry on. Still wasn't happy. God said, you're selfish. Never thought of that. You're self-centered. You can't be happy and be full of yourself. That was an obstacle. Angry, unforgiving, lazy, greedy, controlling, sharp-tongued, jealous, discontented, ungraceful, and the list could go on for miles and miles and miles. That's not even our job to remove the obstacles. And that's the good news. Because you can't change yourself. And not only that, to be honest, you can't even deal with something in your life until God puts a finger on it. That's why it's pretty useless for somebody else to come along and tell you that you need to fix this or that or change this or that. People used to say to me when I was just such a mess, what is your problem? I'm thinking, I ain't got a problem. <laughs> what do you mean, what's my problem? I had no idea. But I tell you what, when God put his finger on me, when God started revealing me to me, oh my gosh. So when God puts his finger on something, our only thing that we can do is number one, agree with God. God, I surrender. You're right. I'm wrong. No excuse. Excuses will really get in your way. No excuse. Guilty is charged. Now I ask you to change me. The second thing you can do is study the Word of God in that area that God is dealing with you about. If He's dealing with you about your mouth, study the Word about the mouth. If He's dealing with you about selfishness, study the Word about selfishness. The Word of God is different than other words. This Word, every word of God's Word is stuffed full of power and anointing. And when it hits your mind, and it hits your heart, and it hits your spirit, there's like a little mini explosion that goes on in there that starts blowing those obstacles out of the way. And then you pray. And here's the prayer that you pray. Help! <laughs> God, help me keep my mouth shut. Every day I pray, God, put a watch over my mouth lest I sin against you with my tongue, because if you don't help me, I will say the wrong thing. Stop telling God how good you're going to be. You're going to be good till you put your feet on the floor, and that's the end of it. <laughs> I bet God laughs when we lay in bed every morning and make our plans for holiness. <laughs> ah, yes, today I'm just not... going to not say anything wrong.
Surrender. God puts his finger on something and you surrender. Philippians 1, 6. He who hath begun a good work in you will complete it and bring it to its finish. Who will do a good work in you? He begins it. And who will finish it? He will finish it. Now that doesn't mean that you have no part to play. Your part is surrender. See, we can be stubborn and rebellious and we can keep resisting God. But if we just surrender. Now, here's what happens. Surrender equals, you got to know this. Surrender equals pain before pleasure. There's no point in me lying to you. When you give up something that you don't want to give up, there's going to be pain. Not physical pain, but pain in your soul. There's a soulish pain. It hurts our feelings. It hurts our emotions. When we don't want to let something go, and we do. When God tells us to go make peace with somebody that, that hurt us, and, and we don't think they treated us fairly, and yet God is teaching us from His Word to continue to love them, and, and, and don't tell anybody what they did to you, and go ahead and pray for them. It's like, ooh. <laughs> Surrender equals pain before pleasure. Be a good formula to put up on a sign and put it somewhere in your house. Surrender equals pain before pleasure. God's given me little things like that over the years. Another one he gave me a long time ago is works of the flesh equal frustration. The moment that I got in works of the flesh and I tried to change Dave or I tried to change one of my kids, the only thing I got was frustrated. Why? Because I left God out of the equation. I didn't go to God and say, God, I can't change anybody. And I need more change than anybody that I know. So I'm praying for them. And you go ahead and work on me, and I trust you to take care of that too. Surrender usually means I'm going to need to give up something that I think I want, but that God, in fact, knows is not going to be the best thing for me. A friend of mine loves vacations, and she particularly likes cruises. And this year, somebody asked her to go on a cruise with them that they had been given for two. So now she's not only going to get a cruise, she's going to get a free cruise. But then she started feeling like she wasn't supposed to go. God didn't even give her a reason. She just didn't have peace about it. Oh, how far along would we be if we would learn to follow peace and not always have to understand everything. So she obeyed, said, I can't go. Her and her husband have been planning a 25-year anniversary trip, cruise, God started dealing with him. You're not supposed to go. <laughs> and then he had to tell her. Then they had some money saved that they were going to use for something, for some decorating. And God started dealing with her to give it away. Ouch, ouch, ouch. But you know what she said to me? I cannot wait to see what God's going to do. See, that's the attitude you need to have. When God asks you to surrender something, you need to get excited because there's something coming down the pipe that's going to be a lot better than what you thought you were going to get. And that's the way we need to live. So, oh, I can't believe God wouldn't let me do this. God never lets me have any fun. I don't know about just being a Christian. You just can't ever have any fun. No, then you need to say, oh, my gosh, 
I know that God is good. I know that He loves me. He would never ask me to give up something that I like that much if he didn't have a good reason. So I trust him and I can't wait to see the harvest that comes in my life from the seed of obedience that God... to sell. Turn to somebody and just say to them, you don't even have to know them, just say when you disobey God, you're only hurting yourself. Now, oneness with God, coming into unity, how many of you understand what I mean when I say oneness with God? Coming into unity with God, letting your mind belong to Him, Letting your mouth belong to Him. Letting your entertainment belong to Him. Letting your money belong to Him. He doesn't want to live, like I said last night, in that little Sunday morning box that we try to keep Him in. Take Him out for 45 minutes to an hour on Sunday morning. Stick Him back in the box. And then just go live like everybody else the rest of the week. No, 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 no. If that's what you want, you're in the wrong building today. And you should try to escape quickly. <laughs> Surrender equals pain before pleasure but I tell you what I'm so happy now I can't understand myself and you don't know how many years I was miserable you do not know how many years I was a miserable Christian you don't know how many years I was a miserable preacher but no more oh no more I tell you what I'm content I'm happy I'm peaceful I don't even have to get my way now to be happy Come on. Now that's freedom. But it's a journey. And I keep getting tested. The toilet paper was a test. I don't care what you think. It was a test. God just checking me out. See, you still got it working there, Joyce? How many of you know that God tests you? Time to time. Pass your test now. If you don't, you'll get to take it again.
hỏi đẹp tựa lòng dân thủy chung chắc 